Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our November 2019 webinar from ACU ID Lab. We're grateful you're able to join us today, most likely on your lunch break at work, to learn from some of our amazing instructors. These webinars will be recorded and available on our ID Lab YouTube site, which will be emailed to you at the conclusion of today's session. On our main website, acuidlab.com, you can also learn more about what we do for professional development. If you would like more information on our online degree programs, please visit acu.edu forward slash online. All of our online degree programs are designed for working professionals like yourself. Today, we will hear from Dr. Joseph Halbert, who I will introduce momentarily. I'm Noelle Awan, and I'm your host this afternoon. You will notice that all participants are muted and hidden, but there will be opportunities for you to participate in today's session using different functions found on the bottom of your Zoom window. Please use the chat for general intros, comments, and questions for Idea Lab. If you have questions specifically for Dr. Halbert, then please use the Q&A feature. Let's all begin using the chat with everyone sharing your first name and the city and state you're joining from. Here is today's agenda. Dr. Halbert's presentation is Be Cool, Practical Tips for De-Escalating Conflict. I will close us out no later than 12.45 with some next step items. And we do welcome anyone who would like to stay after for a Q&A with Dr. Halbert. During this webinar, we will define conflict and explore its roots. We'll consider our own feelings towards conflict, define peace, and we'll also gain knowledge of conflict management theories, skills, and resources. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker sharing some of his expertise with us today. Joey Halbert is an attorney mediator. Let me try that again. He is an attorney mediator based in Central Texas. Prior to working for ACU, he worked as a political staffer in the Texas legislature for five sessions as a general counsel, committee counsel, and budget analyst. He coordinated an alternative dispute resolution program within a 79 county region. And if he wasn't a professor, he would be a bass player in a punk band and or a professional wrestler. Joey is, a, is married to Samantha and they have two young children. Some cool nicknames he has acquired include an unflappable Joe, Joe Cool, The Fixer, and The Specialist. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Joey Halbert. Hey, Noel, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great, yes. Okay, thanks for that. And thanks also for helping to put this together. Uh, really appreciate the folks at Idea Lab, Lori, Ann, Noel, and and the rest who who get these together. I've had a chance to attend. Um, I think this is my third or fourth Idea Lab session, and I really enjoyed the ones in particular on the uh, the Enneagram. I'm an Enneagram one, if you're interested, and also uh, the one about what to do when work gets hard. And I think those are available on YouTube. So if you ever want to go back and watch some more of those, um, they're great not just for the content, but they can also send you down rabbit trails with books to read or podcasts to listen to and things like that. So thanks, Noel, for getting it together. And uh, she mentioned my background, attorney, uh, mediator, politics, so lots of things with conflict. Uh, I even have a master's degree in conflict management. Um, but all of that background and cool nicknames aside, I, I think there's really one thing that makes me qualified to speak on this subject, and that is uh, decades of putting my own foot in my mouth. Uh, I'm a person and I've got kind of a, a temper and um, because of that I've been interested in trying to become better at, at negotiating my relationships with people and also um, a lot of the causes probably negotiating internal conflict and so um, for the past 10 years or so I've been trying to learn more about peacemaking and I hope that um, as I go on this journey some of the stuff that I've, I've learned along the way excuse me will be helpful for you as well. So the first thing I want to do before we actually start talking about the, the theory and the skills and all that is just a little exercise to help us remember that we're uh, people. We're not just disembodied brains or robots that um, interact with others and complete tasks, but we're, we're humans um, in bodies that God gave us. And so I want to create kind of a, a mental central park that we can just exist in for a while. And this is a, a technique called uh, 347 breathing. And uh, 347 is an area code in, in Brooklyn, but that's not what this is about. This is about controlling our breath and being mindful of our bodies to kind of check in with ourselves. 
I picked this up when I was in law school because as I'm sure you know the reputation of lawyers, sometimes there's substance use, depression, um, lots of ways to cope negatively with stress. So the University of Texas has a mind body lab for students where they can focus on mindfulness, meditation, biofeedback and things like this. So what I'm gonna do is go through this myself where I'll do a three breath inhale, hold my breath for four counts and then um, exhale for seven. And then I'll walk you through it. I'll count you off so you can try it. And this is just breathing. So you don't have to do downward facing dog at work or anything if you're on your lunch break. So you can do it on the sly. So I'll do it, then you'll do it with me. Okay, your turn. Inhale, two, three, hold it, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Inhale, two, three, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One more. Inhale, two, three, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Isn't that nice? Feel better? Feel like a, feel like a person? So now that we're a little more focused, um, we're going to go in and in about 15 minutes, teach you everything you need to know about how to be cool. We'll give you this graduate level education on all this. Disclaimer, not really, but we are going to talk about basic theory and skills that you can use to become a, a more proficient and confident peacemaker. So I want to give you kind of a, a brief overview of the things we talk about in our either graduate certificate or our um, master's in conflict management. So the first thing I want to do is kind of gauge where we are as, as, a, as a group today. Do you think conflict's good or bad? Are you a turtle or a shark? I got that language from our preacher, Justin, at Brown Rock Church of Christ. So a turtle you shy away, you go into your shell for conflict, and shark, you go for it. So let me know where you sit on this. Interesting. Okay, so most of us, excuse me, about three out of four think conflict is good. Um, but most of us, um, also are sharks, I guess that kind of makes sense because we think it's good. So we're, we're involved in it, but there's gotta be some of us as well that even though we think it's good, we're a turtle and I fall in that category, which is interesting given my, given my past, I think maybe I swung the pendulum too much, but, uh, that's helpful for me. Thank you. It was kind of a trick question though, because we haven't defined what conflict is yet. And so I want to, there's lots of technical definitions or, you know, war-like definitions, things like that. I want to give you a working definition for our talk today. I'm defining conflict as a perceived disagreement between one or more parties. And perceived is an important word there because there doesn't actually have to be a disagreement. Um, at least one side just has to think that there's a disagreement. And also note, you can have internal conflict. Um, I, I tend to have that. I tend to sit in dark corners and brood a lot while I drink coffee and write in journals. Um, but conflict can also be between people. It might be between departments in an organization, between countries, et cetera. And sometimes it, it's about trivial things like whether or not you should have pineapple on pizza. I'm a solid yes on that. Coke or Pepsi, uh, Houston Texans or Dallas Cowboys, things like that. But conflicts also have to do with state or national budgets. Um, my professor in political science, Dr. Mill Haley, defined politics as who gets what. That's basically negotiation or a lot of conflicts. And um, so these things have serious implications more than just which soft drink we like. And another thing we need to do now that we've talked about how we feel about conflict, what it is, is it good or bad? We, we, we've got the poll, but um, I'm going to give you a classic lawyer answer. It depends. Um, conflict, whether it's good or bad, will depend on a few different things. We're going to list those here, but I think it's best illustrated by a story. Um, Aaron Sorkin wrote Charlie Wilson's War, which is a true-ish story about a, a, a politician and congressman from Texas named Charlie Wilson, who was 
involved in um, some international military efforts in the 80s. And there's just this great story about, about conflict depending on, on many factors. So let me read that to you real quick. There's a little boy, and on his 14th birthday, he gets a horse. And everybody in the village says, how wonderful, the boy got a horse. And the Zen master says, we'll see. Two days later, excuse me, two years later, the boy falls off the horse, breaks his leg, and everyone in the village says, how terrible. And the Zen master says, we'll see. Then a war breaks out, and all the young men have to go off and fight, except for the boy who can't because his leg's all messed up. And everybody in the village says, how wonderful. But the Zen master says, we'll see. I think that story illustrates really, really well that we can't necessarily know whether a given conflict is going to be good or bad. It depends on the, the amount of time, the scope of time we're looking at. Um, just as a physical example, I, I blew out my shoulder and had a surgery. And if you just took the time where I had the surgery, it would, you would think, oh, that's bad, his shoulder's messed up. But in the long run, I'm, I'm able to do more with my shoulder. So depending on the, if the timeline is narrow or wide, it was good or bad. Perspective matters. Um, it depends on, on what you're saying is good or bad. Um, what aspect of it? Was it an opportunity to grow um, or was it managed poorly? That's the third point. Um, did I see it as a fight more than a, an opportunity to grow again? So it, it really does depend and, and that's what we're gonna talk today. We can't know for sure how a conflict is gonna turn out, but what we can control is our part in it, how we respond to it, how we frame it, how we think about it, in other words, and also what we do within it. So that's, that's kind of some of the skill sets we're gonna talk about. And part of knowing what to do in conflict is understanding there are a lot of reasons for conflict. Um, miscommunication and misunderstanding are two big ones. So maybe we're just talking past one another or um, we say something wrong, it just comes out wrong. Maybe it comes out right, but the person doesn't get it. Um, so some, sometimes it's not that we necessarily disagree. Again, it's just that perceived disagreement that we talked about in the definition earlier. Sometimes though, there's, there's real disagreement. Um, earlier, we alluded to policy issues and, and politics or office budgets, things like that. We might just have different um, ideas about the best thing to do. Sometimes um, there might just not be a right answer. So we might assume there's a right answer. We might take the position, well, two plus two, two is the way to get to four, and that's how it is. But 16 divided by four can also get us to four, or six minus two. So maybe we have the same goal, but we disagree about how to get there. Um, also personality issues, both um, our own personalities and those of somebody else. Maybe we're on the same team and we both want the same things, but gosh, uh, that guy in the room, I don't want him there. Um, I know Thanksgiving is coming up next week, and so that might be why some of us are interested in, in de-escalating conflict, um, unfortunately. And I know personality in this, this whole thing has been in the news a lot lately. There was a great Wall Street Journal article today about the rise of the folk heroes of Mr. Rogers and Dolly Parton and what they teach us about getting along with people. So um, personality issues are a big thing, as we all know. And, uh, one of my favorite writers is Elmore Leonard. He's a crime novelist, and he wrote Be Cool, Out of Sight, Get Shorty, all of those kind of things. Uh, he also created the character of uh, Raylan Givens, who's a, a, um, a lawman from Kentucky. And my dad's family is from Kentucky, so that always resonated. But he has a great observation about personality. And he said, um, if you run into a jerk in the morning, you ran into a jerk. If you run into jerks all day long, you're the jerk. And so an important thing to remember in conflict is sometimes it's about personality, but sometimes it's about us. Maybe we're the one that's wrong. And that's hard to accept. And I know in the first maybe half of my studies of conflict, I was thinking, okay, I can learn how to gently correct everyone to my point of view. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. We can grow through conflict. Going back to that diversity of thought we talked about earlier, maybe there's a better way to do things than our two plus two, maybe 16 minus, or divided by four is better. And uh, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit about, <laughs> about a little bit about, I want to talk about this dual concerns model. So academics love to make models and charts and um, things that can go in a PowerPoint. And so this dual concerns model is a great reminder for us that how we handle conflict is going to change depending on what our goals are. 
And the two main things I want you to look at here are on the vertical axis, we have relationship. And on the horizontal axis, we have substance or the meat of the conflict or negotiation. And so um, Ruben, Pruitt, and Kim, their idea is that depending on what's important to us, that's going to change how we handle the conflict. So sometimes it might be good to compete if the, the meat of it's important to us and the relationship isn't as important. An example of that might be if you're buying a guitar on the Facebook marketplace or a used couch for your, your rec room and you just need to get a good deal. You've never seen the person before. You're never going to see them again. Um, on the other hand, if you're deciding with your family where to eat dinner and you don't really care about the substance of it, where you eat, but you want your spouse and kids to be happy, then you're more likely to be accommodating up in the top left corner because the relationship's really important, but the substance not so much. And uh, I, I, the last thing I want to point out here is compromise and collaborate aren't interchangeable as a term, terms of art in the conflict management world. So a lot of times when we hear collaborate, we think, well, they give some, I give some, and things work out. Uh, but that's compromise. Collaborate means you're highly engaged in the relationship and also highly engaged in the substance. And, and so that's collaborates that sweet spot where we try to create win-win solutions. Um, later, we'll talk about a book called Getting to Yes, and, and they say, instead of just getting our piece of the pie, we want to expand the pie. And so um, I think it's just really important to realize conflict doesn't mean we just have to close our eyes and run forward, swing in our fists. There are lots of ways to handle conflict, depending on what is important to us. We've defined conflict. We've talked about what it is, what causes it. We haven't talked about peace. You might have noticed I used the term peacemaker, and that's the term we're really happy of. <laughs> happy of. We're happy to use in our program. And one of the founding folks in our program is our, our current dean. Joey Cope, who's also an attorney named Joey, which is very confusing in our office, but um, he used to be a professor in our program, and he came up with this great formula that peace is the balance of justice and mercy. And I love this in particular because it reminds us, just like we saw in the dual concerns model, that we want to balance our particular goals with our humanity, the humanity of us and the humanity of the person across the table from us. And keeping that balance in line gets us to peace. So we talked a little bit earlier about sharks and turtles. And um, if we're just focused on ourselves, that's not peace. And if we're just focused on giving the other person what they want, that's not peace either. It's, it's this balance. And I don't think conflict is something you, you fix. It's something you manage. And managing it well is, is peace. And I think that's why the folk heroes of Mr. Rogers and Dolly Parton are, are so popular right now is because they're able to bring people together and um, they say hard things, but they say them in a way that makes people listen. <coughs> Excuse me. Very quick, I just want to run through some of the skills that we talk about in our conflict management program and highlight a couple that are important to us. Planning, we talked about a little bit, um, meaning we don't just walk into a conflict blindfolded and, and spinning our fists around like Ricky Bobby, just trying to see what lands. Instead, we look at our goals. How important is the relationship? How important is um, the substance of it? And, and what does the other person need for them to go to their boss and be happy? And what does my boss need to be happy? Curiosity is really important. And this is probably the most important thing, in my opinion, for de-escalating conflict because Curiosity, and later we'll have a slide that says listening, but these two require humility. They require an openness and a transparency, a willingness to listen. Um, and so really key in on that. If you, if you panic and don't get anything else today, just remember to be, be curious, ask questions. Uh, there's different kinds of bargaining. We talked a little bit about that already, about getting your piece of the pie, which is distributive and expanding the pie, trying to think about what other people need too. That's integrative, getting creative. And uh, I'll have a resource at the end, you'll get emailed it, that it has a great book about all that. Next, we have uh, reflecting or reframing. I I've already, I I've planted in this kind of meta lesson where we've already started reframing things. So we've used language like fighter or boxer or war but we've also used language like peacemaker. And that's intentional because I want you to think about when you're in conflict, 
it's an opportunity for you to make peace. And so that's an example of reframing where we're walking around the obstacle or the conflict in a different way to see it in a new light. Problem solving is another skill. And, and so um, instead of just my way or your way, if we're collaborating, then, then we're more open to things and, and we're working to find a win-win solution. And as I mentioned before, listening. Real quick, I want to list some things that conflict can help us do in an effort to reframe and see the benefits of, of being more open in conflict. Um, first, we gather information. We can't fix a problem if we don't know what's there. It helps us to make or keep a customer or a friend. So when I do business with an organization, I don't expect things to be perfect. What I do expect is that when things go wrong, they're going to treat me like a human being and they're going to be open to listening to my problem and they're going to try to fix it. So I actually have more loyalty to companies that get it wrong, but then get it right than I do with um, companies otherwise. And one of my best friends I've had <laughs> the most knockout drag out fights with, but um, we're loyal to one another because we trust one another because we've been through things and conflict gives us a chance to do that. You've heard me mention humanity a lot. Um, conflict gives us a chance to share our humanity. Um, <laughs> Things that Dolly Parton teach us is that we are human beings, and whether or not we agree on things, we are human beings. And I know there's a lot of interest in, in conflict and why our society is so fractured right now. I think the fact that so many of us are asking, what can we do to change it, itself is encouraging because it acknowledges that we do have that shared humanity. Conflict gives us a chance to get better at conflict. A lot of people are nervous about negotiation or dealing with uncomfortable situations, but the more you do it, I can tell you the easier it gets. It gives you a chance to know yourself. Um, as I mentioned, I, I have a history of putting my foot in my mouth. Uh, my nickname growing up was Oscar the Grouch before I was Unflappable Joe. Uh, Grumpfish is a new one I've got from a TV show called Bubble Guppies. But um, when you're in conflict and you're open to it, you can learn a lot about yourself and kind of be formed into a, a better version in the crucible. And finally, as we mentioned before, we can grow in diversity. So um, we hear the word ecosystem a lot in business now, but ecology can teach us a lot about human relationships. And we know that a diverse ecosystem can respond to disasters in a more healthy way. It's more resilient um, for all parts of it, but that, that requires interconnection and the acknowledgement of that. And so that works on a human level as well. The, the more diversity we have and the more that we can cultivate that, create an environment for that, the better off we all are. Okay, so I know most of you seem, seem to be sharks. Tell me what is hard for you in conflict? I'm guessing a lot of y'all will say too fun, but we'll see. Dealing with the emotions of others. Wow, nobody said too fun. And even though we have sharks, a lot of people said, the plurality said avoiding it to my own detriment. That's interesting. What does that mean, I wonder? I would say I avoid it to the because I can make up my own answer because I have the mic. I, I avoid it to the detriment of others where I think I'm being accommodating, but truly what I'm doing is um, I still hold a grudge. And so I'm not really being accommodating. I'm avoiding. And the bad thing about avoiding is, is it's not good for you and it's not good for the other person because that, that negativity can be there. Um, the emotions of others will lead us right into these practical tips. So these are some real world things I hope you can put into practice as early as today, um, whether it's at work or you're traveling next week and visiting family. Um, I hope this makes things easier and helps you be cool. The first is uh, you've already done it. We've learned that conflict isn't necessarily just this battle, but an opportunity to grow, to learn new things, um, to acknowledge other people as people. And I think just knowing that um, helps us helps us have a different posture within a conflict. 
And that itself can de-escalate it because we don't see ourselves as pugilists, but as peacemakers. Um, and also, I, I think that that last point is important, that we're reacting differently, we're responding, and we're, we're modeling better behavior for others, which, you know, people, people can, have you ever been in a room where everyone's cool and then that one weird person in the office comes in and throws everything off? We respond to the energy of other people. And so if you're able to be a calming presence, that rubs, presence, a calm and calming presence, then that rubs off on others. Um, also, I think it's important to think about the big picture and the small picture at the same time when you're in conflict. So um, we all have within conflict our own idea of our identity, of who we are as people. And I think sometimes we forget that so that we can win a conflict. We will do what we have to do to win or to dominate. But I think it's really important that we maintain our integrity of self, that we um, think about who we want to be, the legacy of, of who we are, what we're modeling for our kids, our employees, our coworkers. Uh, be you, hold on to your values. And also uh, think small at the same time. So just because we've had a, a situation before that might be similar, say a similar customer complaint or a kid is throwing a fit or whatever it may be, um, this is not that. This is its own unique situation and time, and it's its own opportunity for you to um, either learn something or, or give something in terms of shared humanity or grow together. So just because you had a bad, bad commute in the morning or you've seen something similar, don't let that, um, that burnout squander this opportunity. I've mentioned listening before. Um, it's not just the words. We've all seen the statistics about how so much of communication is nonverbal. So we want to look at the body language, um, the emotion that's conveyed with the words, the situation itself. Why is it this day or this situation that's causing this kind of response? And as I mentioned earlier, listening requires curiosity and humility. And those, those things signal something to the other person. And that in itself can de-escalate conflict. I've mentioned before, we're not robots. Um, we listen to the emotion of others and ourselves. I'm a big, uh, kind of an emotional advocate, if that makes sense. So neuroscience tells us, um, and this is something that's published in, um, I'm a lawyer in our ADR practice guides, that decisions that are made totally devoid of emotion are just as skewed as decisions made um, solely by emotion. We talked earlier about balance, balancing, um, leading to peace. And that's the case here. So emotions tell us something. Dr. Robert Solomon, who was a longtime professor at, at UT, gave this great talk and the great courses about um, the intelligence of emotions. We feel emotion because we perceive the world in a certain way. So for example, if I'm upset about human trafficking, the reason that I'm upset is because I value human life. Um, either because of my ethics or my religion. And so that anger tells us something deeper about ourselves and how we view the world and vice versa. We can learn about what is important to the other side by what emotions are coming out of them. So you can kind of dig into that to learn more about the situation. Next, we've got the great Barney Fife. I used to watch... Uh, I used to watch the Andy Griffith show every day with my dad after school on TBS with that great whistling intro. Uh, I cannot whistle, but I can do a Barney Fife impression. And here it goes. Dip it in the bud, Andy. That's free. That's for free. Um, and what that means is we want to stop conflict from becoming a bigger problem. And sometimes we can even stop it before it starts. One way we can do that is anticipate needs or problems before they come big things. An example of that, um, I rent cars from the same place when I go on business trips, and they've recently put up a sign and put on all their contracts that there's no animal blood in the cars, and that really stood out to me because it seems kind of over the top and graphic, but apparently when hunting season comes up, they have to put this in their contracts, otherwise they're going to get a lot of disputes with customers about, well, it didn't say I couldn't put dead deer in the back of this Ford Escort. So 
Um, anticipating things before they happen is a great way to, to de-escalate conflict. And that involves uh, listening, which we talked about earlier. You have to be observant about what could potentially be a problem. You have to be comfortable putting yourself in someone else's mindset or seeing the world through their eyes. Um, structural issues can be a problem. Uh, I know, for example, if, if marketing and product development aren't talking, then one of them might do something that the other one was not expecting and that causes a lot of friction. Something as simple as having regular quality control meetings or communication um, through set people can solve problems that would not exist but for structural problems within an organization. So if you're having a lot of departmental issues, um, just sit down with your, your chart or um, otherwise think about what could be done to just smooth those out before they become bigger issues. And finally, I would say um, not only working on your own conflict management skills, but also working on those of your either employees or your peers doing some training is really helpful. Um, for example, one thing we teach in our program is that when we're negotiating or in a difficult situation, we don't use the word but. You don't say, I appreciate all that emotion, but our policy says this. You don't do that because it negates everything that came before. Um, we try to say and, because both things are true at the same time, or we take a pause. So for example, I appreciate that this unexpected event caused a lot of problems for you. This event came directly from the vice president. And so there was nothing that I could do to prevent the event. So you can kind of see the difference. Um, sometimes you do want to use but though, um, if you want to negate things. It's been a hard year, but things are looking better with our new team. Um, so sometimes it's not necessarily, as we talked earlier, it can just be a miscommunication or misunderstanding, a, a posture issue that causes the problems. And so just learning a few little tricks like when to use but, when to use and can be helpful. So the shield means defensive. So it's natural for us to get defensive in conflict, but uh, Ken Cloak and uh, Goldsmith, who he's married to, wrote a great book called Resolving Conflicts at Work. And they point out that um, even though it's counterintuitive, being open in conflict instead of closed is helpful because uh, resistance indicates an unmet need. So an open posture can let you know how you can better meet that need. And, and also it can be helpful to be transparent. That's another form of openness. So explain why the decision was made. Um, walk them through the information that came in and how the decision was made and why that was the output. So even if somebody disagrees, um, at least they know you took the time to talk to them, you explained it. Um, they might not agree with where you arrived, but at least they know how you got there. And then you can kind of discuss that instead of the relationship or the mistrust. And uh, I've mentioned getting to yes before. It came up with a great term called negotiation jujitsu. So what I'm saying here is practice verbal jujitsu. Um, when somebody comes at you hard, just be cool, um, kind of do the opposite. Um, listen to them. So don't push against, but flow with uh, what they're doing. And a great way to do this is to ask questions. Um, it's very hard to be angry in your lizard brain if someone is specifically um, honoring your emotion and your issue by learning more information from you. In other words, you, <laughs> you can't be mad if you're answering questions. So for example, um, if somebody comes into your office and they're really upset about points A, B, and C on a contract or a document, ask them, okay, so on A, is it this clause? What if we change it to this? What do you think we should change it to? Um, if we change B, what is that gonna do to departments, to the other departments? How are they gonna respond to that? What would you do if you were me on C and you had to balance um, these concerns? Um, as you do those things, it, it does show that respect and it, it also kind of disarms them and it gives you valuable information so that you can turn a potential enemy into an ally. I would say following up is also important. So the, the same people that might come in angry might just need to know that you care about them or that the problem is being addressed. Maybe they've had something go wrong and so trust has become an issue. 
Um, so a practical thing I used to do at the Capitol was just to set a calendar reminder to talk to those frequent flyers or the, the squeaky wheels. And I wouldn't tell them I had a calendar reminder, but if something had gone wrong or they were contacting us a lot, uh, that, that indicated it was a, you know, a sore spot for them. And so I would just give them, give them periodic updates to let them know where their issue or their bill or et cetera was in the process. And that doesn't have to look like much. It's just maintaining that contact over time can help rebuild trust. And I would say if they're the type of person that calls you, call them back, don't email them. And if they're the type of person that emails, then email them back or text them back if, if that's what they do. Because that medium is a form of communication and they're telling you what they're comfortable with. So meet them where they're comfortable, if at all possible. We started with the uh, three, four, seven breathing. And I think that's important because we are people, as I mentioned, we're not robots, we're disembodied brains. And so one thing I would always do before or after rough meetings is take a walk because it lets me be alone. Um, lets me physically get the tough things out of my body and it lets me um, process what happened. It helps me avoid <laughs> jumping straight into something else in a bad frame of mind. So I'm not answering the phone or talking to somebody when I shouldn't be. Uh, mindfulness is important. Mindful just, Mindfulness just means awareness. Um, so you're aware of what's going on in your body, your thoughts, how you're feeling. There's a great app called Insight Timer and uh, it's free and I use that and it can help you with doing the kinds of exercises we did earlier to kind of center yourself or to figure out, um, I didn't know I had a headache uh, through a body scan and why do I have a headache? Is it, am I mad because I have a headache or do I have a headache because I'm mad? I didn't know my back hurt, things like that. Uh, if you're a person of faith, prayer is really helpful. The app was called Insight Timer, two words. If you're a, a person of faith, prayer can be really helpful. Um, not just because you're giving it to your creator, um, but also because when you do pray for somebody, it, um, it changes your posture towards them. Because <laughs> if you've taken someone to your, your God or your, your deity, then um, you care about them. And that's going to change how you're handling the conflict with them. And I would also say stretch. Um, that's another way to be in touch with your body to find out where the tension is. Maybe to realize that there is tension. It helps you notice your breath, whether or not you're on edge. Uh, I'm a big yoga person. Uh, yoga means union. So you're, you're marrying your body and in, in, uh, mind and thoughts, et cetera. Um, but if you're not into that, the, the Insight Timer app has some, some great kind of mindfulness things. Um, if you do want some yoga resources, Yoga with Adrian on YouTube is great. A lot of free stuff, free content. And it really helps you um, get recentered so that you're in control of yourself and in tune with yourself before you go into a conflict. And it is interesting to note so much of dealing with conflict and de-escalating, it just deals with um, managing ourselves, noticing ourselves. Then finally, I just want to point out that a lot of conflict comes from online issues. Um, email is confusing both for the sender and the receiver. Um, I was very excited when I was in law school to clerk at this big international nonprofit and I was ready to change the world. And it turned out most of what I was doing was just uh, mediating disputes between employees who were getting in email fights. And the reason that happens, as we all know, is that it's hard to know how an email is going to be uh, interpreted. And so um, consider over, over emphasizing your emotions, like exp explain exclamation points or um, over punctuating or being a little more, I guess, cheery than you are in person. Um, <laughs> if you're like me and you're a grump fish. Um, text also confusing. Consider using emojis to help people know your intent. Um, one thing you can also do with email is to read it out loud the way you intended, but then maybe try to read it out loud in a way it could be intended. And uh, it might not be coming across as you think. You can also ask a friend to look at it, a coworker to, to make sure that's coming across the way you want. 
And interestingly, there's also new tools to determine the tone of uh, your writing. So for example, Grammarly can now tell you if your email is hopeful, confident, does it seem like you're a rebel? Are you challenging with the email? Um, so just keep in mind that a lot of these problems happen on accident. It's a miscommunication thing or a personality thing and um, try to assume the best. I think we've got one more poll question. My answer for this one is to be a whole person, but don't let that influence you. Yeah, listen and open posture. Those two are um, very related. I hope that that's gotten through um, in the talk. And I see that Verbal Jiu-Jitsu is also up there. And in a minute, we're going to talk about some resources, and I can direct you towards books that are helpful for that. OK, so I'm a big book nerd. Um, I love Goodreads. I'm on Goodreads. According to Goodreads last year, I read, I think, 91 books, which was a personal record. I'm in the 60s so far this year. Um, so I love slapping things out. You've noticed I, I've mentioned Insight Timer yoga with Adrian already, but here's some great books. Um, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, whether you're religious or not, has amazing advice about the value of silence and weighing your words and the power that words have. And so um, I recommend just going through that periodically to remind yourself every day um, that what you say matters and also what you don't say matters. If you're dealing with high flyers, this book uh, by Bill Eddy, who's a social worker and an attorney, BIF is great. So BIF stands for um, brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And he helps you formulate responses that won't get you bogged down um, with people that just want to fight. Getting to yes, we've mentioned, that's, that's the one about expanding the pie, creating win-wins, um, verbal jujitsu or negotiation jujitsu. So that's kind of a classic business book. You've probably heard of it. Um, Power of a positive no is really good for the holidays. It, it helps you create this, this um, affirming Oreo of how to craft responses to people and explain that um, because you value certain things, that'll take you away from other things. So for example, if someone invited you bowling on Wednesday night at 11, you can say, thank you so much for inviting me to go bowling with you. Uh, I really appreciate that. I've got a get up and do the turkey trot at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, so bowling isn't something I can do, but I would love to watch football with you tomorrow so we can hang out. Um, how would that work? So see, you said no, but you've affirmed the relationship and you've explained why. And on the next slide, we have a couple more. Um, I've mentioned earlier on the, the nip it in the bud slide that sometimes um, the best way to deescalate a conflict is to eliminate the situations that cause the conflict. And a lot of conflict comes from social media because we're getting invites on the comment section that just don't really drive things forward. And so if you're on the fence about that, I recommend this book by, uh, by Jaron about 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts. I did that about five months ago and it really changed my life and I'm not exaggerating. Resolving conflicts at work, we already mentioned. Um, Great advice if you're interested in being more open, especially if you're a manager, um, how to deal with employees with what you could reasonably call bad, uh, bad behaviors. And uh, if you're interested in improving your thinking, this last book by Aldo Pucci, The Client's Guide to Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. The next slide, if you're a person of faith, mentions The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. This is a Bible-based method, and this was also a life changer for me. It uses uh, the steps that Jesus laid out to resolve um, conflict. And it also has these great terms of peace faking, peace breaking, and in the middle, peacemaking. It's kind of that balance we talked about earlier. And I think that's, that's all I have. And I think Noelle's going to pop back in for us. Oh, yeah. So in summary, you're a person. The people across from you are people. And so 
acknowledge that. And, and I think our culture is very interested in that right now. So um, be a model for that. Reframe how you see conflict. Um, you don't have to be a turtle and you also don't have to be a shark. You don't have to be a pugilist. You can be a peacemaker. And um, the more that you learn about this and the more you practice, you'll become better at it. Um, you'll gain confidence and, and you can even be cool. And maybe people will give you a, a nickname. Better than Grumpfish. <laughs> That's my closing thought. Don't be Grumpfish. Well, thank you so much, Joey. And we will open up for Q&A shortly. Uh, while you're thinking of questions for Dr. Halbert, um, you'll see a, a link posted in the chat for anyone interested in finding out more about our online degree programs. And you will receive an email in the next 24 hours with a recording of today's session, along with the recommended resource list that Joey just covered. And the follow-up email will also include a brief survey. And we would appreciate your feedback as we continue these webinars in the future. Uh, if you've participated in the survey in the past, uh, please continue to do so. That's very helpful for us, for us. And we've also added a new question for desired future topics. So we'd love to hear from you. And if there's a webinar topic you'd like to see in the future, we can definitely try our best to make that happen. We would also like to invite you to ACU Online's Open House webinar next week on Thursday, December 5th. I'm sorry, that's in two weeks. December 5th at 6.30 p.m. And you can learn more about the online undergraduate and graduate programs offered at ACU Online. We're also going to post a registration link in the chat for this event. So if you do have further questions, feel free to email us at idealab at acu.edu. And we want to sincerely thank everyone for joining us. A special thank you again to Dr. Halbert for sharing your knowledge with us today. And we will open it up for Q&A, so feel free to post your questions in the Q&A feature, which can be found at the bottom of your Zoom window. And so far, I don't see any questions posted in there. We did have a couple people ask about the app, um, which was the Insight Timer app. And then I think you also mentioned the YouTube uh, channel Yoga with Adrian. Or the two That's resources right. are open for you. You yeah. got it. And Insight Timer is free and there's a ton of free stuff. It you do have the option to paying for a subscription for more stuff, but you definitely don't need it. And Yoga with Adrian is free as well. Um, if nobody else has anything um, that they want to ask during the webinar, of course, you can email us. And if it's something specific for Dr. Halbert, we can always relay that for you. Um, but we can go ahead and conclude today's session. If you have further questions, visit our website or email us. Um, the web address is acu.edu forward slash online, or the email is, uh, I'm sorry, or acuidlab.com. And we want to thank everyone again for joining us today at ACU ID Lab. We hope you have a blessed day.